Introducing uh, Emily Stelzer. Did I say it right? Selzer. Okay, I said it almost right. Emily teaches at Houston Baptist University. Um, Emily, just come on up, grab one of these seats, and uh, uh, you will be ready to go. She has her PhD in literature from the University of Dallas. And if you go to HBU, you can study classics under her, study literature under her. She went to Hillsdale College, which is a uh, a school in Hillsdale, Michigan, isn't it? And uh, don't they send out like the Hillsdale newsletter or something like that? Yeah. Imprimis, that's what it's called. Uh, 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 and anyway, she is just an outstanding student who wrote her PhD on Milton. Your PhD, where's the micro, here's the traveling mic. You get the traveling mic, Emily. Um, your PhD dissertation was on? Uh, Milton and philosophy of eating in Paradise Lost. You gotta hold it straight up to your mm -hmm. mouth. Milton and the philosophy of eating in Paradise Lost. Eating. So, yes. Like food. Eating, food, yes. That's right. All I, right, give I've it to us. I've heard that there's a story about the first sin involving eating, so. Ah, I, I, I okay. Tried to unpack that a little bit. Unpack. No one had done that yet. Oops. All right, fair enough. Well, Emily, would you join me in welcoming Emily to our <laughs> panel? And in addition to Dr. Emily Steltzer, we have Dr. Philip Donnelly. Dr. Donnelly is from Baylor University, also a Miltonist, has his uh, under, uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees from Canada. So this is a, a, a University of Ottawa uh, for your PhD and your master's, but your bachelor's, University of British Columbia. So this is our Canadian weekend. You'll see why in a moment. Um, you wrote your PhD on what became the book entitled Milton's Scriptural Reasoning. Milton's Scriptural Reasoning. You are a Miltonist, an associate professor at Baylor University. You teach uh, a number of different things uh, in the Honors College. Uh, so any of you uh, uh, folks out there who wind up going to Baylor from Providence, this is the man, you take his course. He will give you extra credit simply for coming here as a high school student. <laughs> Just remember to remind him. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And then our featured uh, uh, guest for the weekend is uh, uh, Dr. Dennis Danielson. And Dennis, thank you for coming here. Dennis and his wife Janet have come in from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, if you read the Wikipedia page on Milton's Paradise Lost, you'll see references to Dennis Danielson and some of the positions he's taken. Didn't know if you knew that or not. Uh, Dennis has been well published in the field of Milton. And how long ago did you publish your first work on Milton? What year were you born? Uh, I, I, um, I'm not, I'm 1960. You didn't do nine, it that early. 1982. 1982. And so Dennis will be our featured speaker tomorrow night. I'm excited to have him here as well. We've, I've asked each of these folks to submit to me a set of questions that they think would be good questions to be asked. And so I've got a set from Emily, I've got a set from Phil, and I've got a set from Dennis. And then without them, I sort of wrote my own. And they have no idea what mine say. So as we look at mine, we will be throwing them curveballs that they're not at all prepared for that have a really good chance of stumping the panel. So with that, I think we're going to have some fun. Let's unpack this and let's begin. How did you meet Milton? And we'll start, Dennis, with you. Microphone to the mouth. How did you meet Milton? Well, I'm going to get heavy really fast um, and personal really fast, if I may. Um, in 1971, I experienced my first tragedy in life when my sister was killed in a traffic accident. And one of the people I trusted was my English prof who had given me a full year course, sort of in great books. It was biblical and classical backgrounds to English literature. And I went and 
poured out my sorrows to him. And he said, Dennis, I think you should take my Milton course in the fall. So that was the fall of 1971. And I did. And so I was personally working through issues of grief, issues of the, what's called the theological problem of evil, and reading Milton at the same time. And Milton, I might say more about this later if there's time, but Milton allowed me in a literary and a philosophical way, but sort of at arm's length, to work through some of those really difficult problems that we all face at some point in our lives, especially if we believe in God. How could this happen? To put it really in a high flute way, why is reality all so screwed up? Um, and that was my really deep end uh, first introduction to Milton. All right, fantastic. Philip, would you tell us how you mel met Milton, please? Well, uh, I suppose I first came to terms with the Paradise Lost uh, and Milton's writing as a graduate student. And I uh, was interested in questions of, we call it the literary form that divine revelation takes. So I was interested in questions about, well, why isn't the Bible a systematic theology text? And those sorts of questions. Why does it come to us in the form of narratives, other genres? And, uh, and I was studying Renaissance literature, still trying to figure out what I was going to do. And it ended up I was able to study Milton at that time. I'd had the uh, misfortune of uh, studying as an undergraduate at a place where uh, they, they were, didn't permit the study of Milton. It was one of those you know, godless secular universities. Uh, and uh, they said, just study Shakespeare, that's enough. Uh, so to my shock and delight, I was introduced to Milton as a graduate student and, uh, and it allowed me to, to connect things in, uh, in the life of the mind and uh, the life of faith that uh, would otherwise be held apart very often. Okay. And um, I did hear about Milton a little bit in high school, but my love of Milton, I think, began when I was in, completing my undergraduate work at Hillsdale College. Uh, one of my professors, Michael Bauman, had published on Milton, had studied under um, a very important Miltonist. And I knew that he was enthusiastic about this guy. I loved him and loved how Milton interacted with scripture. And so my interest in Milton was especially associated with his, like Professor Danielson, his interest in theodicy and making sense of the problem of evil and justice and God's benevolence. Uh, my professor, Michael Bauman, unfortunately kept on promising me that he would offer a course exclusively on Milton, but that didn't happen in my four years before I graduated. But I stayed on for an extra summer so that I could take his course that he offered on Milton. I forced him to, to offer that course, and he was so kind, so charitable, that he actually let me sit in on that course without paying for it, even though he, cre he uh, yeah, definitely taught that because I had bothered him about it enough. So um, his enthusiasm led to my interest and enthusiasm for Milton as well. All right, if we could pass the microphone back down to Dennis. Um, as, as we hear about the way you were introduced to him, and Dennis, you told us about your personal tragedy and, and trying to address these questions. Um, uh, this, Milton's stated purpose, I think, at least, uh, if, as I understand it, for writing Paradise Lost was to justify the ways of God to men. Um, uh, it sounds to me like that's one of the reasons you came to Milton to understand the ways of God and, and whether or not they could be justified to man. Is that fair to say? That's right. That phrase, justify the ways of God to men, occurs right at the beginning of Paradise Lost. And Emily used another term that you may or may not be familiar with, theodicy. Theodicy was actually a term that was coined a bit later in history. So theodicy and justifying the ways of God to men are equivalent expressions. Um, it's a tricky business because, you know, I'm me and God's God, and who am I to demand a justification for God? So there's there's always the issue of of reverence, of piety. Um, but you know, there are characters in the Bible who who ask God, "What's all this about? What's going on? Is this fair?" Job is the most conspicuous example. Uh, so yes. Part of the purpose, Milton's epic purpose in this amazing poem, 
poem, the greatest single work of literature in, Eng in the English language, and nobody's going to argue with that, um, <laughs> sets out to do that, to explain, not, not in a totally watertight, comprehensive sense perhaps, but to give you tools, intellectual tools, spiritual tools, poetic tools for understanding how perhaps this universe created by an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God could contain evil. Okay, so before we pass the microphone down, let me ask you this question. Does Milton achieve his stated purpose, at least to you? And if so, how? And if not, why not? And the same question I'll repeat for Philip and for Emily. I don't know that it, any human argument or any human effort can fully achieve that purpose. It's an enormous purpose. Ultimately, I don't believe it's Milton who justifies God. I believe it's God who justifies God. Uh, but Milton makes made it, for me at least, uh, not easier. Easy isn't the right adjective. Um, a lot more reasonable, a lot more coherent to think of God as good and all-powerful in spite of the evil in the world. Again, it's not watertight. There are all kinds of loose ends, you know, especially on bad days. <laughs> um, but there is, I did find a kind of satisfaction in, in the thoroughness with which Milton tackles the problem, the theological problem of evil. I think that's about as far as I can go on that. Fantastic. Uh, Philip, uh, I'll repeat the question and, and hear your answer from scratch. Milton's stated purpose to justify the ways of God to men, to address the problem of evil, to address why bad things happen to good people, to all of these. Uh, does Milton do a good job of achieving his purpose? If yes, why? If not, why not? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I suppose I should say by way of introduction, that my, my, my best introduction to that was actually Dennis's book, Milton's Good God, by the way, if you want an excellent introduction to these issues. But uh, uh, I would go grammatical on you and say, I would back up in the sentence that you quoted at the beginning. And it, he actually, the fr full phrase begins to assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. So there's two issues. One is providence and one is um, justify in the sense of to show God's justice. That isn't, not in the sense of, uh, again, uh, constructing a sort of definitive logical proof, but to make it possible to imagine uh, how God could be just, given the state of the world. Uh, I think that's an important distinction, but the other is that he's taking, as a point of departure, asserting eternal providence. And one of the things I've discovered over the years that through the Milton's uh, middle decades of his life, he was constantly in debate with people who asserted providence but in fact, it did not see the justice of God's ways. Right? People who uh, said, well, I believe in providence, but in fact, their account of God, in Milton's view, actually made God look like a tyrant. Um, these would be the people typically who uh, made the connection between the fall and the character of the fall as God arranging that, but who also then drew some uh, implications from that that, that Milton thought were, were dangerous and uh, opposed to, to Christian uh, revelation. So. Um, I think the first thing would be to, to clarify that, that it's actually given. If you believe that God governs the universe to a good end, that's what providence means. It's not predestination, right? There's no medical centers called predestination medical center, but there are some called providence, right? It's, it's the idea that God governs the universe to a good end. Uh, if you believe that, to what extent is God's justice intelligible to human beings? That's the question that he's setting out to answer. Uh, rather than, I think, He's, he's less interested, I think, in what we call the, the uh, traditional philosophical question of the problem of evil, because uh, I don't think he had as much difficulty with it as, as some moderns have, uh, because he had a different approach to the question. He's more interested in saying, if you believe in providence, uh, you should be able to, be able to, uh, to some extent, even being a finite fallen creature, in light of scripture, you should be able to believe that God is just, and to be able to discern that. Uh, and to discern his care in the details of our lives. So, All right, Emily, how does he measure up to his purpose? 
Well, as you first asked that, I started thinking, okay, I can say this and this and this and this and this. And I think you hit on most of it, but um, Professor Danielson's remark that it's ultimately up to God to justify himself, I think is a great place to begin and end. I will add this, though. Um, I, I, asserting eternal providence is a really important part of Milton's project, and I see that. I see Milton as successful in doing that, insofar as a human, as a poet can do that, by uh, just emphasizing with the imagination, um, presenting a view of what God's created world is like before the fall. And his emphasis on Eden before the fall is beautiful. And uh, that brings to my imagination a, a, a very uh, vivid picture of God as a provident, as a good God. And uh, one of the ways that he tackles the question of evil or of sin, I think, is with the answer, free will, because Milton, um, Mi Milton's God cares about free will. That's extraordinarily important. And that's partly because of a second thing. Milton cares about love. He does care about charity. I think sometimes we uh, focus, oh, turn away from Milton's emphasis on charity, but at the end of Paradise Lost, he says charity is the soul of all the rest of the virtues. And uh, you can, give a rational or a logical argument for what God is doing in the world, but if you don't have uh, the answer that portrays God's relationships with humans, that characterizes him as a loving God, and one who wants us to freely love us, then I think that the picture is unsound. But I think as far as a human poet can do, so Milton does a good job of presenting those attributes of God to the Christian imagination. Okay, now, um, before you pass the microphone on, I don't know which of you wants to answer this question, but I wanna take a step back because I suspect that some among us have not read this book, or some among us have not read it afresh. Um, the original Paradise Lost uh, was written in 10 books. Uh, I think the second edition or somewhere in there, he moved it to 12 books. Uh, but um, I would wonder if one of you or a combination of you might give us a three or four minute overview of what he wrote about so that as we dig into some of this, people have a frame of reference to, to, to what we're discussing. So who, who wants uh, to give the, the Con Reader's Digest convinced version of Paradise Lost in three minutes? All right, I'll try. <laughs> I actually should call some of my HBU students in the audience to come up and do this one. <laughs> They're shaking their head no right now. <laughs> Uh, so it's the story of the fall. It's Genesis 1 through 3 expanded into 11,000 lines of poetry. Um, it begins with Satan in the bottom of hell. He's just recovered from being kicked out of heaven, and he is going to have a council with his demons and decide how he's going to get God back. And he decides that the best way to do so is to attack what God loves, uh, this new creation, Adam and Eve, mankind. And so... Um, what we have in the story of Paradise Lost is from there a ascent to uh, book three where we go into heaven and we hear God who already knows what's going on and he somewhat is laughing at uh, Satan's meager attempts to try to destroy God's master plan. And uh, that's where we get a lot of Milton's theology also from um, Milton puts words in the mouth of God which is perhaps a dangerous thing to do. Uh, Dante chose not to do that <laughs> when he presented his Christian epic. <clears throat> From there, book four, we have the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. We get to see what they're like. We get to see what paradise is like. And then uh, God wants to send, and this is extra biblical, but uh, he wants to send an extra angel to Adam and Eve to warn them further not to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so the angel Raphael comes down to Adam and Eve in Eden, and for books five, six, seven, and eight, he has a conversation with Adam and uh, sometimes with Eve about the war in heaven, about Satan's fall, and also uh, about God's plan for Adam and Eve. Uh, afterward, we have uh, book nine, which uh, dramatizes the fall. Uh, it explains, as um, Milton um, tries to do, to explain how a perfect human being created in God's image could choose to disobey God, given paradise, given God's providence. And then afterwards, in book 
10, 11, and 12, we have the aftermath of the fall, the post-lapsarian story. And that includes what happens to Satan afterward. That ha also includes the Proto-Evangelion, or the first gospel, or the promise of uh, the seed of the woman um, defeating, crushing the head of the serpent. Uh, it also includes uh, an angel, once again, this is the angel Michael this time, who is sent down uh, to Eden, to Adam and Eve, not just to usher them out of Eden, but also to give them a promise of the future. And books 11 and 12, which C.S. Lewis described as an untransmuted lump of futurity, it's just way too, uh, too much going on in the last final book, the final books of Paradise Lost. But that is Milton's uh, way of showing not just Adam and Eve, but his readers, uh, what is going to happen for the rest of history after Adam and Eve leave the garden. Wow. <laughs> yes. And just an important footnote, in Paradise Lost, Adam becomes the very first Christian because part of what he sees is the coming of the Christ whom he then personally confesses as his savior. Okay, so within that framework. Can I add one more footnote? Yeah, absolutely, Philip. I, just uh, regarding the, the structure, often people ask, you know, why add all this detail? Why not just start with book nine, because if that's where the action is? The issue is, what does the fall mean? There's no, there's no suspense here. Nobody's going to pick up Paradise Lost and go, I can't believe they did that. You know, they fell. You know? So that's not the issue. The issue is, what does the fall mean? And so the preceding books actually take readers through a series of distinctions, through the action, to say, to be tempted is not to be fallen. There's a character who does that and is not fallen. To be uh, subject to uh, error is not to be fallen. To be deceived is not to be fallen. So he works the reader through a series of distinctions before the fall actually happens to make it clear exactly what the fall means, both in its setting and its consequence. And that's why the long wind it. Oh, don't lose the microphone, Philip, because I want to come back to that, and I want to weave in something you said earlier. You said at the time Milton's writing that there were those who believed that, uh, that, that made God look like a tyrant, I believe is the phrasing you used. Um, I suspect there are some who read Paradise Lost and when they read it, they think that uh, Milton almost paints Satan as a hero and God as something less than, than good. Um, comment, please. Sure. Uh, Milton's preferred way of describing that process, that the reader, I mean, this is the other problem, is that many people in survey courses often only get to read books one and maybe two and three, uh, and then the selections from nine. Uh, so there's a problem there in terms of how you perceive the poem. But Milton's word for describing what happens is what he calls in his text called Areopagitica. He calls it trial by what is contrary. Trial? That's, say that slowly. Trial by what is contrary. That is, that people can come to a knowledge of the truth by being presented with something that's quite different from the truth. All right. uh, by being presented with counter arguments, you discover what is true. Uh, and and he, he, he argues that that, in fact, is what happens often in scripture, um, as well as in other texts. Uh, and the first thing about the Satan as hero, uh, I would simply say uh, that's a pretty straightforward uh, issue. Uh, in, another word, in effect, Milton's saying, hero, you keep using that word. I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> and, and what he does is he says, he explicitly, the poem says, by comparison, Satan supersedes every human hero you could ever imagine. It's explicit in the first book, two books of the poem. By the time you get to book nine, he says, actually, people have chosen, this is in the, the epic, the, the, the invocation to book nine, the, the narrator says, uh, the problem with most epics is that they have this screwed up notion of heroism that depends on exclusively warrior virtues and has forgotten the more important virtue of heroic martyrdom. And he says, what he's arguing for is a poem that actually reconceives what a hero is. So he takes, starts out with the, what he's going to say, the reader's assumptions about a hero, puts them in, in that context, and then works through, well, maybe our assumptions about what a hero is aren't what we think they are. Something similar happens with saying God is a king. And, and of course, this is very controversial in England in the 1640s. You remember they ended up executing their king? There's a little bit of controversy about this. So it's to say God is king. 
You keep using that word. I don't think that word means what you think it means, right? That's what he's doing. He's taking them in process Those of saying. Those of you who are too young, that Princess Bride. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes. So he's uh, he's taking the reader through a series of of revisions to say actually kingship in book five we find out that what the quintessential king does is he gives his authority away for the good of those who are under his authority. That's what God does, and that's the thing that Satan cannot handle and causes his rebellion. Yeah. So. All right. Well, you have. Been, we're going to bring the microphone back to Dennis for a moment. You you have brought up three subjects. I'll try to get back to because each of them valuable in the way you've introduced them now. But I want to start out with, uh, uh, Dennis, one of the, the first books, if not the first book you, you wrote on Milton, I think, is Milton's Good God. That's right. Um, uh, can you explain what caused you to write that book and what you are saying in that book, please? All right. Well, that will take me back to the story with which I began, which was a personal story and an effort to work through issues related to the theological problem of evil in a kind of, you know, egghead, arm's length, academic way, but a way that really did connect with real life. Um, so I think that Milton was looking for a good God, and I certainly was looking for a good God. So that doesn't make the deck entirely stacked in advance, because there are lots of Milton critics who, who are very, very critical of how Milton presents God, um, and who with their own beginning assumptions assume that there's no possible justification for God. So it, it began as my way of working through those issues and you know I was killing two birds with one stone. I was not just trying to work it through personally. I was I, do, I had to write a PhD thesis on something <laughs> um, and, and why not why not funnel my energies into this. So I, I worked on it for a few years in Oxford and then finished it up at Stanford. Uh, actually, the Lanier Library tried to give me two PhDs. I've only got one. Uh, and they were focused around this, it was, it was focused around this thesis. Um, that, that Milton tackles the problem of evil, uh, as Emily mentioned, in connection with the issue of free will, dynamic agency. That's actually quite an exciting and important teaching. It's one that um, the well-known author Mark Lanier tackles in his recent book, um, and, and many other authors do, because it's not, just, it's not just an historical or even just a theological question. It's a real, really important moral question. What is the nature of human agency? What does it mean when someone makes a right choice or a wrong choice? Is it just something that's determined by somebody else or something else? Um, so that was one of the issues that Milton worked through and helped me work through. Um, and then there are the issues uh, related to just the difficulties of life, the hard edges of life, which you can't necessarily trace to sin. And one of the things I noticed in Paradise Lost is that Adam and Eve in this unfallen scenario that Milton lays out so beautifully, as Emily mentioned, um, at, in the middle of the day when the sun is standing high in the sky, um, they go into their, into their bower to have lunch. Because technically, even in paradise, if you stayed out too long in the sun without SPF 35, you would get, you know, it would be unhealthy. So, so there, there, there are physical limitations that are part of our creatureliness that Milton was aware of. Um, so I, I found his, his pre-fallen treatment of dreams of difficulties. You know, Eve actually cries tears before the fall because she has a bad dream that was inspired by Satan. That doesn't make her fallen. So that part of Milton's presentation helps me, I think helps us understand life's finitudes, life's difficulties, life's challenges, not necessarily as punishments, not necessarily as the result of sins, but part of what it means to be uh, a creature. Um, so, the creature of a good God. And so that's, that's just a partial answer. That's great. I Emily, I want to swing it back to you, and I want to take what Dennis has said and combine it with something you discussed earlier. You had said that Milton cares about free will and love. Dennis has been talking about the experiences, for example, of Eve and her dream. Um, uh, 
comment please about what Milton has to say about Adam and Eve in relationship, marriage and love, before the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, because as, as a, a non-Miltonist reading, someone might look at it and say, you know, it's amazing that Adam seems to have this obsession with his wife and his wife seems to have an obsession for independence uh, to some degree. But, but I'd like to hear your thoughts as a, a female who reads it, and then we'll uh, get Philip to comment from the male perspective. Wow. For what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> um, Milton, I think, when he's creating Adam and Eve, he's creating his idea of the ideal marriage when, uh, when he's describing Adam and Eve before the fall. Now, and can I can I insert one narrative detail here? Anytime. Uh, or historical detail. Uh, while Milton's writing this, which I think he wrote over a period of like six, seven, eight years, I don't know how long, um, his second wife dies. He loses an infant daughter, and he actually marries a third wife. So he has experienced uh, uh, the ups and downs of, of, of this marital union while he's putting together a poem that speaks of marriage. So with that data, please sure. continue. And, and I kind of want to protect him by not saying this, but it's important perhaps to add that he also was one of the first people to write in defense of divorce on the grounds of incompatibility. Um, so he definitely had um, an idea of the dissolution of marriage and then also an idea of what a perfect marriage should be. Um, his uh, his relation, understanding of the relationship of Adam and Eve before the fall uh, includes Adam being made in the image of God and Eve also being uh, created by God um, and extraordinarily beautiful and pointing to God, but someone who um, is, ha her, her access to God is, uh, there are certain passages in Paradise Lost in Book 4 that focus on Eve's passage, or access to God being through her husband. So it's a little controversial, certainly, um, for um, the time period, I think Milton is doing um, something that could possibly called proto, be called proto-feminist in the value that he gives to Eve in comparison with a lot of the misogynistic literature at the time. So I'm just going to th throw that up there. I mean, maybe, maybe we can uh, fight over it a little bit later. Uh, but I would say that when... I think that Milton's Adam and Eve before the fall have a holy marriage and it is celebrated and that includes spiritual, moral, social, and physical components. Milton actually has a marriage hymn. He has um, his narrator sing Hail Wedded Love and there's this beautiful poetry that supports marriage before the fall. And I think in that passage, he also talks about the perversions of love that we see today, but that's not to say that uh, love is inaccessible after the fall. Um, when Milton has Satan spy on Adam and Eve, um, Satan uh, leers, he's um, something of a peeping Tom. He wants to know what it is that Adam and Eve are doing in their bower. And uh, that's the occasion for I think Satan to look like look at his low, lowest. Uh, it shows uh, something um, just distasteful, salacious, uh, evil about Satan. But it also is a place where Adam and Eve's relationship is uh, purported. It's presented as pure, as holy, as beautiful. Uh, Satan looks at Adam and Eve and he says that they're mysterious and he talks about their mysterious parts. But that word mysterious is a very important word that we get in Ephesians when Paul talks about marriage. Um, it's mysterion, that's the, that's the translation for the, word, for the word sacrament. And there's, I would say, even though Milton is not, somebody would say that a marriage after uh, the fall is sacramental. I would go so far, Milton is like a Protestant who is a member of a church of one, um, but Milton's um, idea of the best relationship uh, between man and woman is holy, is sacramental, is something that can lead man and woman to God and it can provide grace. So um, I don't know if that answers your that's question entirely, answer. but that's- Philip, uh, from the, the male perspective, how do you read that? 
Well, as you can imagine, this is a, a topic of some controversy, but I think it's worth pointing out that if you look at other Renaissance authors, very often they're not actually even having this conversation about uh, the controversy, about how uh, these questions of, of the relationship between Adam and Eve get placed. I think this, the most straightforward way to describe what Milton is doing in his depiction of Adam and Eve is to say it, marriage itself is a, an image, actually an imminent image of the form of the good. Actually, the human, the human good, flourish, human flourishing is embodied in marriage. Uh, and there is a long involved argument we could have about how, why he's doing that. Um, but uh, to that extent, he has, he, he has explicitly, has Adam ask for a mate of, from God who is, um, who is his equal, right? And it's explicit in that part of the text. Um, and the point at which there's that sort of notable sort of uh, reference to he for God only, she for God in him, is the passage in which, in fact, she referred to earlier as, it's the part where Satan's watching them. So it's his narrative perspective. It's Satan who sees, who sees that difference. I would also point out, just to again, go grammatical on you, it's a, it's a, it's a question of final cause. The, the word for indicates what's the for, right? So it's not necessarily like uh, that there's a, a kind of mediation as though Milton's positing that there's an ideal in marriage in terms of mediation, that the husband has to mediate, but he's talking about the good, right? Um, and how there's a, a cooperative uh, dimension to that. The, um, uh, so there's a couple of things there. With respect to the, the separation scene, I'm, I'm on publicly on record saying that this is actually Milton's point of the separation scene before the fall is his insistence that um, Adam and Eve are both individually sufficient to make the right decision. And he's emphasizing that through the, 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 the separation, that he wants to insist that, that when, when Eve goes off to be yeah, independent when she goes off to work by herself and says you know I, I can handle this and it, it, it looks in retrospect of course hindsight's twenty twenty. it looks like maybe it wasn't the best judgment uh, in retrospect and that is when she gets tempted and succumbs to the exactly. temptation okay. yeah so but the point that Milton's making at that point is that if in fact she's not sufficient to withstand temptation if she's not uh, able to make the right choice at that moment, then uh, Milton's clear, God's responsible if she's not sufficient. So the point is, and that's why he pushes the envelope. Because if there's a flaw with Eve, then obviously it's God made her that way, right? So he's, Milton's alert to that, right? So he's, he's, he's pushing the sufficiency of, of Eve as an individual, as well as Adam as an individual, to make the right decision at the moment of choice. That's All right, all. Dennis, please. Yeah. Uh, just to add one thing and to, to, to tie, that, tie this conversation into what we were talking about earlier with free will and agency. Um, a lot of people have recognized, of course, that it's not a suspense story. We know that they're going to fall. You know, it has to be Adam and Eve and not Adam and Bruce, as they used to say. Um, so there are a lot of characters and situations that are given in the story that Milton tells. But one of the marks of Adam's agency, traditionally, in the exegetical tradition, is that he gets to name the animals. God creates the animals, but Adam gets to share in divine agency and reveal an extent to which he is in God's image by naming the animals. That's a given in the exegetical tradition, in the biblical tradition. But Milton makes something else up. In Paradise Lost, Eve names the plants and that's from out of nowhere, as far as I know. So he's taking great care to demonstrate both Adam's and Eve's reflection of the imago dei and the exercise of agency through language and through care of the animals and of the plants. Okay, now, um, uh, for the non-providence students who may have forgotten their Latin, uh, imago Dei, meaning the image of God. Uh, uh, within the framework of that, uh, you're bringing back a little bit of what Emily was suggesting that Milton, even though we might read him as being quite chauvinistic in some ways, when you compared him to the society in which he wrote, he was actually fairly progressive in his views of, of, of uh, things like this. Uh, I wonder if I, I, I've read that, for example, in the expression of 
the fullness of the relationship of Adam and Eve and, and the fact that they shared a sexual relationship before the fall, that Milton is actually our first author on record to really go out and express the idea of a sexual Adam and Eve before the fall. Um, I racked my brains to see if that's correct, and I cannot find any writers who have done that before Milton. Um, anybody come to y'all's minds? Was it, how, how, talk to us about his cutting edge. What was it that Milton was saying? Cosmology, whatever you want. Where was Milton cutting edge for his day? Well, let's stick with gender relations because they're generally quite interesting. Um, there, there were, I have read writers who, who refer to anonymous writers as proposing that there was actual physical sex before the fall and then rejecting that idea. But I, I can't cite chapter and verse of anybody who actually did what Milton did. Um, what, I like the expression of zooming out and zooming in. What Milton does is to zoom in on the Garden of Eden and on, in on Adam's and Eve's relationship. Go back to a point that Emily made a moment ago. Milton in the 1640s became notorious as a defender of divorce. To cut a long story short, Milton defended divorce not because he didn't believe in marriage, but because he had such a high view of marriage. Milton believed the marriage was not only a physical union of a man and a woman, but an intellectual and spiritual union of a man and a woman. And therefore, if physical adultery was grounds for divorce, so also a violation of the union at the, phys at the intellectual and spiritual level ought to be seen as justification for divorce. So that was a high view of marriage, even though he became, you know, in the popular press, uh, notorious as a divorcer. Um, and so when he, you know, a decade later, bit more than a decade later, was writing Paradise Lost and zooming in on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, I think he had to ask the question, oh, so do they do it? And the answer was a resounding yes. If you read um, St. Augustine on uh, his commentary on Genesis, um, he thinks that Adam and Eve... You know, the fall happened so fast that they didn't actually have time to get around to that part of their marriage. <laughs> really fast. Um, but also that, that that which makes, I won't go into great physical detail here, but that which makes physical intercourse possible didn't obtain before the fall. That the kinds of passions, good passions that surround it, didn't obtain, didn't exist uh, before the fall. So, and link it up with theodicy while we're at it. Justifying the ways of God to man, that is to human beings, if we look at the fall and um, hear, hear Milton or some epic poet saying, you know, we should never have fallen, but by the way, um, sex is a result of the fall, at least some people are going to say, well, good thing that we fell. I, I'm not being facetious. <laughs> there are all kinds of things that we consider, I think quite rightly and quite even piously, good and wholesome and right that Milton then brings in before the fall so that we're not left regretting, or rather, so that we're not left cheering for the fall, because that would put us in an impossible readerly and moral position. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, so I want to shift gears for a moment. We've been talking about it from a, 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 a perspective of, of seeing uh, themes like that within the book. I want to go to the characters for a little bit and discuss the characters. And maybe the best place to start there is to ask you who your favorite character is and why. Philip, you've got the mic, and then you give it to Emily, and we'll bring it back and let Dennis finish this one. I don't know what yours is, so I can't steal it. Uh, uh, I would say, just off the top of my head, I mean, to me the most interesting character in some ways is, is Raphael, the angel. He's the one that, that people were like, well, why is this guy in the story, right? Uh, initially. 
when you when you look back at the the apocryphal book in which he appears uh, as as someone who's trying to save a marriage, right? Uh, there's a, a whole layer of meaning to kind of Raphael's backstory, as it were. Uh, but um, as the the one who introduces, it plays a central role in that showing of divine justice, right? Which is what justify means to show God's justice by preparing Adam and Eve against temptation by doing what? Telling them about who this character is that's going to try and, and uh, uh, tempt them uh, by telling them about what happened before uh, they were before humans create were created, and then uh, asking questions about what. Uh, Adam remembers since his creation and drawing him out and getting him to tell his own story. All those, those ways in which um, Raphael uh, plays a role in that sort of pre, uh, pre-lapsarian human development, I think is, is to me uh, most fascinating. He's, he's the first teacher, and as a professor, I find that fascinating. Uh, for, for those of you who uh, may not be fluent in the Apocrypha, Raphael does save a marriage in the Apocrypha. He's not simply a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <laughs> he actually had life before that. Okay, first character, our favorite character, okay. Emily. Uh, favorite character, I'm going to go with Abdiel. I really like go him. Go with who? Abdiel, and he's an angel in the war in heaven, and he's the angel that is actually underneath Satan when Satan is Lucifer, the good guy. And so he does what he's told, and he goes off to a midnight meeting in the quarters of the north of heaven, and uh, he is the faithful angel and the zealous angel. And he listens for a little while to Satan's speech, but he interrupts very soon, and he is the one who lets you know that just because you are in the wrong group or the wrong place at the wrong time, you still have the freedom and the opportunity to say no to your boss and to go to the boss's boss, which is God in this instance. And so he retreats from Satan's troops when he's the only one who does so, and he returns to God, and God praises him and says, well done, faithful servants. Um, if I wanted like points for a really strong character, I'd go for the son of God. He's pretty awesome, too. He's the one who gets to drive out all the demons from heaven, and he has the keys to his dad's car. He rides a awesome chariot of paternal deity. That's what he uses in order to just shoo Satan and his guys out of heaven. So that's that's a really awesome moment for the son. Okay, Emily, before you pass the mic down, Abdil and what he did, um, uh, we have these Providence High School students who may be leaving us at any moment now. Does that even apply to our ability to say no to being in a peer pressure group and things like that, lest we get practical here? Yes, Mark, it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Uh, that's the Dennis. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I'm going to give almost exactly the same answer that Emily gave. Um, I love Abdiel because Milton made him up. His name means servant of God. Uh, and he's, he's about 85% Milton, actually. Um, he's one of the completely optional characters of Paradise Lost. He doesn't even have a backstory, uh, but he is a sort of model, as Emily has more eloquently said than I can, as someone who can stand up, penetrate with his mind the illogic of Satan's position. Satan, and I'll say more about this tomorrow night, Satan emphasizes the power of God but completely suppresses the goodness of God. And Abdiel stands up and says, how dare you? But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there and say, you're being impious. impious. He also says, but Satan, think about ourselves. Think about the goodness and the privileges that we have. Where did those come from? They came from the hand of the creator. In fact, the hand of the creator as brought about through the agency of the word, the son of God. So he's really in some ways the, the first person who, who makes an argument based not just on the goodness of God, but on the centrality of Christ. All right. Uh, Philip, if we go to you, um, I tried to write down some traits, some characteristics of Satan, just based on my own reading. Um, some of these uh, you may agree with, may disagree with, but, but I, I look at Satan as he's been 
uh, anthropomorphized, as he's been made kind of human in his uh, makeup uh, in some ways. I see him as arrogant. I see him as charismatic. I see him as persuasive, cunning, deceptive. Comment, please, on Satan as portrayed. Well, I, I, let, you could start with the biblical warrant for the decision to start with Satan's character. I think that's important, which is Milton knows that if all you have is Genesis 3 and you go through the rest of Scripture, uh, before you get to the book of Revelation, there's nothing in Scripture that actually says that that snake is Satan. It's not until you get to Revelation 12 where you get the explicit identification of that serpent in the garden. And Revelation 12 is where you have the story of uh, the war in heaven, which is the story that Raphael tells to Adam and Eve. And it's the story then, so what Milton's doing is weaving that scriptural text back into the gap in Genesis, between Genesis 2 and 3, which is to say what happens between creation and the fall. So that's the reason for then the characterization of Satan saying, well, who is this serpent? Right, so he takes that biblical material and leaves it back in. I think he's, um, in in fact, going back to this question of what is power uh, without goodness, right? In a creaturely form, right? Satan exemplifies that, right? He's uh, exemplifies the the perfected attempt to uh, to get what one imagines to be whatever one's good is. Uh, through simply um, self-will, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be through deception or, or, or the other characteristics that you, you name. Uh, in that way, he, uh, yeah, he nicely demonstrates that, that, well, I guess there's other things to say about the other uh, say, uh, fallen angels uh, in terms of how they relate to him, but um, uh, that's, yeah, there's lots, that's all I'll say about Satan. But. All right, very good. Emily. Um, the portrayal of Adam in some ways Adam reads to me heroic and in some ways he reads to me as even a greater sinner than Eve um, talk to me about Adam hmm. okay I mean he eats of the fruit knowing Right. In a different way mm -hmm. than Eve eats of the fruit. Mm -hmm. um, Adam eats from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of evil, um, of good and evil, knowing that, that it is forbidden, knowing where it comes from, knowing and trusting that this is going against the divine prohibition. But he looks at Eve, and he knows that Eve has fallen, and he doubts God's providence, I think, in a moment because he doesn't know whether or not he can give up Eve or whether or not God can save Eve. And he decides to choose to fall with Eve rather than to obey God at that moment. And so um, it's a perversion of love, going back to your comment about uh, Adam and Eve's relationship. Uh, Raphael has warned him about this beforehand, and in fact, Adam has been a little bit nervous about his love for Eve. Uh, he knows that when he is in her presence, everything seems to pale in comparison with her. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll learn more about that in the idolatry lecture uh, tomorrow night. Uh, but Raphael tells Adam specifically, in loving Eve, and loving your wife, you do well, but in passion, you do not. And for Milton, uh, this passion would be an inordinate passion of putting his wife above God. So um, is, he, is his sin greater than Eve's? I, I, I'm not sure about that. I don't really want to rank Adam in Eve's sins. It's different, though, and it's, I think, a lack of trust in God to... Uh, provide for him and to provide a way out for him. Um, he, he is naturally drawn to Eve. He feels the link of nature, and that's a good thing, but that becomes uh, an extreme, and it becomes exacerbated when that link becomes more important to Adam than, um, than and his link between himself and his creator. All right, good. In, in, in the process of characters, we'll pass the mic down to Dennis for a moment, although you others may want to say on this as well. 
we, we read a lot of God the Father. We read a lot about the Son of God. Tell us about the Holy Spirit in Paradise Lost. Well, you're, you're touching on a rather uncomfortable area because uh, one of the things that Milton, not so much in his own day, but centuries later when his prose writings on theology became known in, starting in 1823, was that his own, his own doctrine of the Trinity is, to use another technical term, really wobbly. <laughs> uh, and there are some good reasons for this. I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity is not an easy doctrine for anyone. What do you mean, one God, three persons? So, I mean, maybe there are a few people in this room who could give really, really a good textbook answer. I, I, I probably would fumble it too. But uh, Milton's logical mind really balked at, at a good Nicene definition of the Trinity. Uh, and so that's actually one of my disappointments with Milton, that what he says about the Son in De Doctrina Christiana, which is his big theological work, and what he says about the Holy Spirit um, are, are kind of non-Trinitarian. And this is a dilemma for me, because in Paradise Lost, the Spirit of God, he doesn't say Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God, is what really allows him to get that epic off the ground in the first place. But chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. That's, it's the Spirit of God who's the source of whatever wisdom it is that gets fed into Paradise Lost. And if I may add about the Son, um, when we get into Book 3 and God pronounces judgment on fallen Adam and Eve, uh, a lot of readers think God's just plain harsh about all of this. But if you realize that that's not just God, period, but it's God the Father, who is then replied to by God the Son, who says, Father, let's not be so harsh. Let's provide a way of salvation. In fact, count me man, I will provide the way of salvation, then you have a much more robust theology, a much more robust soteriology, doctrine of salvation, uh, than if you simply take God the Father in Paradise Lost. So, so there are those aspects of Paradise Lost that strike me as being quite small o orthodox, uh, but then he's got this other prose work that we have difficulty fitting together with that Christocentric and spirit-filled picture that we have in Paradise Lost. And I've got no simple answer to that. So within the framework of that, Philip, what do you find disappointing in the book? Oh, I want to answer his question. All right. Uh, well, because I, I, I'm actually very skeptical about the authorship of De Doctrina Christiana. I'm sorry, uh, I have faith. The, the text, that, we, that prose text that he was referring to, I'm skeptical about Milton's authorship, and that's a long story. I would, he brought it up, so uh, I don't think I'll bring it up, but because he did, I just have to say, specifically on the question of the Holy Spirit, the author of De Doctrina Christiana says, never invoke the Holy Spirit. Paradise Lost explicitly does this. Uh, but there's deeper issues that I think, there are all kinds of reasons that uh, I, I wouldn't rely too heavily on De Doctrina Christiana. At the very least, I wouldn't rely heavily on Gloss, using it as a gloss for Paradise Lost, if you do what you did, right, which is to go look at the beginning of Book 11, at the way in which the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all invoked at the beginning or described as we're operating, it's, it's a classic example of what theologians call the economic trinity. That is, the, the, all three persons of the trinity working together to effect salvation. So I would say Milton's pretty textbook on what you call the economic trinity. He's uh, scrupulously silent on what theologians would call the imminent trinity, that is the, the way in which theologians talk about the relations among the persons in the trinity. And uh, I think the reason he's scrupulously silent is because people who insisted on towing the line on the economic trinity were the people who were locking his friends up and, and executing them. And that's why he's silent on the economic trinity. But, but within the framework, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, within the framework of that, look at the development of the Son of God and the development of God the Father versus the development of the Holy Spirit. In, in Paradise Lost? In Paradise Lost. Yeah, so in Paradise Lost, you have the Holy Spirit appears in the invocation in the reference to the spirit that brooded over the vast abyss and it plays a role in creation and draws a parallel between his own uh, poem and the act of creation and, and calls upon the Holy Spirit to inspire him. The Holy Spirit is also invoked uh, in the invocation to book seven where he talks about Urania, the heavenly muse, as a, is, as a figure for the Holy Spirit. Um, and then you have the explicit invocation or the, the, the depiction of the work of the Holy Spirit in book 11. So there isn't a, um, and, and it's what you'd expect for the Holy Spirit, given the Holy Spirit's role, as distinct from the, the, the incarnate logos. I mean, you look at I mean, someone reading the four gospels and saying, where's the Holy Spirit? Well, it, it, the Holy Spirit's there at various points, but it, it's obviously, uh, it's the incarnation narrative we're talking about, so there's a, a different uh, characterization. Uh, so, I mean, there's a way in which the, the, the narrative shapes how that, the, the Holy Spirit's work gets depicted, but I think it's clearly there. So you don't, you, it does not bother you that made up angels get more of a treatment than the Holy Spirit does in Paradise Oh, Lost. oh okay, that's your question, yeah. Well, it, the, the, uh, oh, who's to say those angels aren't empowered by the Holy Spirit? I mean, it, it, the Holy Spirit showing up as a character, I mean, is pretty minimal in scripture. I mean, if you look at biblical text, I mean, what, I mean you could ask the same question about, you know, the, uh, the uh, revelation of God to Abraham, right? He says, where's the Holy Spirit there, right? Uh, when those, the visitors come to Abraham, well, uh, are those angels? Well, why does God send angels? Why, really, the question is, why are there angels? That's your question, really. Right? Yeah, but, but why are there angels you, at all? Look at it in terms of when Milton was writing. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm transitioning into lawyer mode a little bit here. And you use your example of the, the angelic visitors or mm -hmm. the, the three visitors to Abraham. The medieval church would typically, have, and the Renaissance church, would typically paint them androgynously because they viewed those three as the Trinity. And there was a strong yeah. line of theologians sure. who said that the three visitors are Father, Son, Holy yeah. Spirit to Abraham. Sure. And, 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 and you've got a strong presence of, of a doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the church at the time that mm -hmm. Milton's writing. And I'm, I'm just yeah. telling you as a non-Miltonist reading it, it's yeah. kind of like, Man, you, you, what you do? You gave him three verses? I mean, you just like, yeah. didn't give him much. Yeah. You see him very the, present. The Holy Spirit's uh, at work empowering the whole thing, as you, you pointed out at the beginning. I mean, there's a way in which he's, he's, he's relying on the Holy Spirit, uh, and that's the nature of the Holy Spirit's work. Oh. Right? I mean, and the thing with angels, I think, is really notable, and it's curious. I and mean, this is one of the great things about teaching the text, when people start to ask these questions, specifically about why, why do angels show up? It's like, well, why does... Why are there angels in Scripture, right? Why doesn't Why don't you just have a pre-incarnate Christ show up every time Michael shows up in Scripture? That's a kind of curious question, don't you think? Um, and I think we have to go back to the the meaning of angel as messenger, and and uh, start there and thinking about it. All right. All right. So Emily, you can either comment on the Holy Spirit or you can answer the other question. What are your dis what, What's a disappointment you find in Paradise Lost? Um. I think this is a disappointment that I have with myself. Is that okay? Yeah. When I'm reading Paradise Lost, I'm still not sure what to do with the angel Raphael. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's extra biblical. I mean, yes, it's it, Raphael is in the Apocrypha, but he's not a visitor to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. So my disappointment is that I can't figure out what Milton is doing with Raphael in Paradise Lost. And uh, he is sent down with the God, God's words. God says, make sure that you, um, oh, what, are, what are his words? Um, uh, he, he says, converse with Adam. And he also says, make sure that you warn him. He is a warning voice to Adam. Um, and his job is to satisfy all justice. Yes, that's, that's what the narrator says after, uh, so spoke the eternal father and satisfied all justice, something like that. Um, so if, if Raphael is necessary to satisfy justice or perhaps even to justify the ways of God to man, then is he necessary to the story of Paradise Lost that Milton creates or is he also necessary to God's larger project 
And what are we supposed to do with the fact that that angel is not in there in Genesis 3? Does that poke a hole in Milton's project that he needs an angel to remind Adam and Eve not to disobey God and also to tell them some stories that they wouldn't be able to intuit on their own, which is the story of the fall of Satan. So um, here's the problem. Not only does that complicate things because it's not in scripture, but it also complicates things because now it has presented to Adam and Eve the characters to their immortal imagination what it is like to disobey God. And does that create problems? Now, you might say that that enables their free will to be tested in a way that it wouldn't be tested otherwise. Uh, but Raphael is troublesome to me. It's when Raphael starts talking with the guys, I mean, he's talking with one guy, Adam, um, but it, it's like locker room talk when Eve's, Eve is smart, she can stand there, she can converse with the best of them, but she decides that she wants to get up and leave and tend her flowers and then come back later on so that Adam can fill her in because she wants to hear the story through Adam instead of through uh, the angel Raphael. But that provides the first occasion where Adam and Eve are no longer hand in hand or joined at the hip uh, or side by side. And that's a troublesome precedent. It's not sinful. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong with Eve going out and doing something on her own at this point, but it's troublesome and I'm not sure what, um, I think I'm disappointed in myself for not exactly figuring it out yet. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Uh, a totally no. off the wall type question for a moment. And, and I'm gonna ask each of you some favorite type questions. So here's, here's the first one. Um, a number of illustrators have illustrated Paradise Lost. We've got Blake, uh, Dory. We've got, I think, uh, an early edition in the late 1600s had 12 plates that were done by two or three different folks. Um, do you have a... Don't steal one of those from the thunder. I will not steal your thunder. I will also add that one, two, three, four, five of our montages at the start of the chapel on this side over here uh, deal with scenes that uh, are spoken of in Paradise Lost. My, my question to you is, do you have a favorite illustrator? Each of you. I mean, one where you've studied the illustrations and you think, man, he's caught this, or he's caught that, or she's caught, you know, and, and you just sit there and say, I really like this. What I typically do is emphasize the point that there aren't illustrations, and and the, the and by way of simply requiring students to to rec to notice that they they actually have to imagine the text uh, in order to answer certain kinds of questions in the biblical text as well as in the uh, the poem. So that the question, if you're reading Genesis three, the question, what is Adam doing while the snake is talking to Eve? You can't read the story and not imagine an answer to that question. You imagine he's somewhere, but the question is where, until you have to fill the gap and the question is how. And then illustrators will answer that question for you differently. The one point I do make is that in 17th century illustrations, they typically uh, read more like comic strips than our image of a snapshot of time. There's a sequential character to them. And so often for 21st century readers looking at a 17th century illustration, they're kind of confusing because you have the same character appearing five times on the same picture and it's like, well, where are they? It's like, well, it's because it's a, it's a sequential uh, o ordering. Um, so that's just a, a heads up. But I, I, that's as far as I go on the illustrations. But. All right. That, that happens, by the way, in some of the depictions up here, as we noticed last night. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to steadfastly refuse for 24 hours to answer your question because I have the picture that is my favorite and I will add it as a footnote tomorrow evening. Please come back and I will explain then very briefly why it's my very favorite picture. Very um, fair. Yeah. Very fair. All right, Emily. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, Gustave Moray's Fall of Satan with his bat like wings, even though that doesn't quite work with Paradise Lost, the description. I think it's. It's on the cover of <laughs> there you go, Phil Donnelly's book. It's a good one. I like it. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, there's a, uh, a a 20th century illustrator, Carlotta Petrina, d that does a really good job of um, creating uh, just vines that 
uh, interweave parts of Paradise Lost in her illuminations and uh, she does a good job of just showing how Satan is not just a snake but he's a snake whose uh, folds wind in and out of the entire story and I, I really liked um, that one. I think it's Carlotta Petrina and let's see what else. There's a there's a Medina, I think, uh, portrait of Satan with the face of Charles the Second. I mean, that's just amusing. <laughs> now, is it, Charles is the that the Medina? There, there's a there's an illustration of Satan. There are a couple of illustrations of Satan and different illustrations have chosen their favorite political enemies and put them on Satan's face. Yeah, now, so now your, your that's class, curious. Your, your students laughed at that, and and it was noticeable that it was your students who laughed. So maybe for the rest of us, Charles II was the king of England. That's correct. At it, the time of the Civil War in England. Uh, a after no, afterwards. A that's afterwards. correct. So. Who was the king during the Civil War? Charles the. Charles the first. Okay. Yes. Wow. Unfortunately, he lost his head. He was, yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple inches shorter at his death than he was. <laughs> In his life. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, uh, next favorite question. Is there a passage that you've committed to memory because it really was something that spoke to you? It spoke to you emotionally. It spoke to you intellectually it spoke to you spiritually is there a passage you've committed to memory and uh, uh, if so uh, what might it be okay um, well I was preparing to write on Paradise Lost for my dissertation I had uh, the, the audio of Paradise Lost on loop so there are a lot of times where I can fill in sentences but don't know the entire thing Probably all of us at this table could write, read, recite the first 26 lines of Paradise Lost. Um, those are important, those are momentous. For any epic poem, the beginning lines really tell you what's going on, what the author is about. Um, but uh, there are a section of four lines also from uh, book seven of Paradise Lost, lines 125 and following. Uh, and that became a key passage for m my ideas that I was working on in my dissertation. And that was the analogy between food and knowledge. And this is where uh, Raphael says, for knowledge is as food, let's see if I mess it up, and needs her temperance over appetite to know and measure what the mind may well contain. Okay, you gotta do this real slow. I've already lost the whole uh, start of that sentence. Yeah, it, it's it's the anastrophe, it's the syntax is all yeah, over yeah, it. Yeah, so do it yeah really knowledge slow. is food. Okay. Knowledge, knowledge is, food. is just like food. Sort of. In some ways. <clears throat> uh, Should I even continue with this one? There's a dirty joke at the end of it. Oh that's okay. <laughs> we're 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 good. knowledge is go ahead. Knowledge is as food and oh goodness, now you're uh, and needs to know in measure what the mind may well co or contain. Oppresses else with surfeit. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's right. Wow, I, I you can't, say it, I can't do it to slow. Be able to do yeah. it. Knowledge is food and do it fast and needs to know in measure means. what the mind may well contain. Oppresses else with surfeit and soon or soon turns uh, wisdom to folly as nourishment to wind. There you go. So in other words, you need to be able to temper your desire to acquire knowledge. You can't be too idolatrous in your love of information too, just like you can't be too idolatrous in your love of other things that get in the way of God. Um, information, knowledge is a good, and knowledge can lead us toward God, but when it becomes a God in itself, things get out of hand. And just like when you eat too much after a Thanksgiving meal and you get the itis, or you know, you just sit down in your seat and you are not feeling well because you overcommitted to that meal. Uh, well, uh, you can also stuff yourself with knowledge and that knowledge no longer becomes nourishing, it becomes wind. Okay. It's a fart joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brain That's yeah. right, yeah. it's a brain fart. Oh, <laughs> Philip? A uh, quotable passage, then maybe after you no. quote it, uh, tell us why. I would have said, you know, the ones I can quote, it would be the opening lines is the ones I would typically, if you had to you know, spot me, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. Say it again? Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree that first brought death into the world. Yeah. I, 
I would, but I actually, the, the lines I want to memorize <laughs> are the lines uh, that, the, the lyric passage, because the thing with epics is that they, they typically don't give you those purple passages, right? And this is one of the points that C.S. Lewis makes in his preface to Paradise Lost, that you don't get the, the necessarily the same kind of in quotability, right, in an in, in uh, uh, epic narrative. But uh, there is a passage where Eve is speaking to Adam, and she's, she, she ha there's about 15 lines where she declares her love, the incomparable character of, of actually all creation, right? But without you, it's nothing, right? And she ends with this, but then she ends with this question, and it's an astronomical question. It's a question about astronomy. And uh, she says, but why do the stars shine all night when there's no one here to watch them? And Adam gives a kind of bluffing answer. But when, when you get to book eight, the question the passage you were talking about, that's why she gets up to leave. Because she's waiting for him to answer the astronomical question with a similar response of caresses and expressions of love. But it's this beautiful uh, lyric passage uh, of declaration of love in the context of, of the reflections on astronomy. Uh, so. All right, thank you, Bill. Dennis? I would hate to keep doing this to you, Mark, but I'm going to recite the first invocation tomorrow night. Um, so I'll go to my plan B, which is, was, which is to allude to something I've just found out is one of Emily's interests, which is um, what I sometimes jokingly call the picnic scene uh, in Paradise Lost. And this pertains to Raphael as well. Raphael is sent down. Adam sees Raphael coming through the trees, gets all excited, turns to Eve, division of labor, sorry. Um, she's in charge of lunch and, and asks Eve to put on something special because they've got a guest coming. So this is one of the le legitimate challenges in the world before the fall as well as after. How do we entertain guests in our home? And so the first guest in Adam and Eve's home is, is Raphael. But then, once lunch is served, Adam thinks, oops, I wonder if he actually eats the way we do. And, and, and part of the message, and he does eat the way they do. And part of the message is that there's a comparability between human beings and angels that's demonstrated by the angels actually eating, just as after the road to Emmaus, the resurrected Christ sits down and eats bread and fish with the disciples to demonstrate that he hasn't become something utterly other. There's a kind of commensurability that runs through the hierarchy of creation, which also means that Adam and Eve themselves, if they don't fall, might become more angel-like. And so the lines begin, your bodies may at last turn all to spirit, improved by tractive time, if ye be found obedient. And so Adam and Eve, the message there is, yes, there's a comparability between what we think of as higher and lower parts of creation, spiritual and corporeal. It also means that Adam and Eve aren't, as it were in Satan's view, condemned to an eternity in this enclosed garden. They have outward and upward trajectories that can be actualized if they don't sin. Can I add to that too? I think that's a really important part of what Milton is doing because otherwise, I mean, Milton's thinking ahead. He needs to make sure that Adam and Eve are, as God says, sufficient to have stood, but free to fall. But if they're sufficient to have stood and uh, one of their delights and duties in paradise is to create more of themselves, uh, Milton is thinking in advance. He wants to make sure that faithful humans can continue on for generations if they remain if they remain faithful, then where are they going to go? They're going to over it's a population issue. And he wants to make sure that they have the opportunity to ascend to heaven. Uh, he also wants to make sure that anything good that comes after the fall is not um, out of the realm of possibility or doesn't have a good counterpart before the fall. And so what we have is the promise of heaven after the fall with Christ. 
and Milton wants to make sure that Adam and Eve have that promise of heaven as well. So there is a physical explanation for how Adam and Eve and their progeny can ascend to heaven and be uh, even spatially closer to God. Okay, um, uh, I've got two more areas of questions and, and we try to end this somewhere around 3.30 to 4 and so we're drawing it to a, a close. Um, first, uh, if you look at other works of creation and fall, uh, Tolkien's Silmarillion, for example, uh, he's big on music, he's big on song. Uh, the songs of the angels, the songs of creation, the, the songs uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, you look at his face trilogy, you've got some interesting perspectives on creation uh, uh, there. Um, where is music within the world of Paradise Lost? Um, in the same place as in the stories you just referred to. That's the short answer. Uh, if you, when you follow the, the track of the narrative. Part of Raphael's visit is to tell Adam and Eve what happened before humans were created, and the story he tells them sounds an awful lot like what uh, English readers recognize as Genesis chapter one. So you get what's called biblical paraphrase, so it's recapitulating Genesis chapter one in book uh, seven of Paradise Lost. But if you look at what he does, the paraphrase isn't just quoting, right? He's, he's adapting, and the things that he adds the particular details, all of them are elements of what are called the quadrivium, right? So there's references to arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy are all woven into uh, the narrative in particular ways. So that's typically where you get angelic song. Angelic song also appears in, in book three, obviously, in terms of praise of the divine. Of course, when the angels, before Satan falls, what the angels are doing are, is dancing, uh, which is what you'd expect good angels to do. That's what they dance. So. Um, so there's, there's, there's dance as well as song, uh, and, and, and the act of creation is, is, uh, is shot through with uh, both uh, music as well as the other uh, uh, mathematical arts. That's Emily, anything to add to that before we... Yeah, the angel... Uh, music is very important. Milton's father was a great musician. Milton had an ear for music from him, and also I would say that the lines of Paradise Laws have a cadence that is very musical, so the poem, I think, is musical itself. Uh, but Milton focuses on music as an important component of praise. Um, I would say that there is a musical quality to the poetry of Adam and Eve's prayers. They have formal but unanimous and spontaneous prayers that they uh, give to God in the morning and in the evening. And uh, another passage of Eve's, Eve has just some extraordinarily lyrical musical passages. And her final, uh, I think it's about 15 or 16 lines too, to her final words to Adam before they're leaving the Garden of Eden is a sonnet of sorts where there's no rhyme, but there are, the, the, word, the end of the words are matched by idea it's instead of by sound. And it's just absolutely beautiful, lyrical, and I would say musical. Uh, and that's an important part of praise. Um, Milton's, uh, Milton asks about, or when Eve asks about the angels or about nighttime and why they shouldn't be staying up and praising God. And uh, Adam has a response about the importance of music, but also the importance of rest. And that's what music is. Music does require periods of rest in order to be music. And there's something harmonious there. There's sound and silence, and there's spring and autumn, and there's uh, a beautiful twilight and brightness dancing hand in hand in, even, in, in Eden and in heaven. And so there's that musicality and that dance that is a part of uh, Adam and Eve's uh, Eden, but also heaven itself. Dennis, anything to add on the music? Um, one of the things you referred to, the creation of Narnia in The Magician's Nephew is lifted almost straight from Paradise Lost. And song is the central metaphor for the act of creation, both at the divine level and at the human level in Paradise Lost. The first request of the heavenly muse is sing, 
heavenly muse, and Milton repeatedly refers to his song. So the act of creating poetry, the act of uh, drawing out the story um, is embodied in that picture, that metaphor of, of song, which is an infusion of the verbal and the musical. I'm curious, Milton was blind during much of the time he wrote this? Do you see um, it? All of the time that he was okay. writing it. He was blind by about 1652, and we generally think that he started writing Paradise Lost about 1658. So, so this is entirely the work of a blind man um, it's not often treated as an oral epic, but in some ways it was, because Milton would lie awake at night in the dark, obviously as a totally blind person, uh, compose on his uh, mental computer screen um, 20, 30, 40 lines, and when he'd get up in the morning, he would recite them to a secretary. And so the uh, outside of Milton's own brain, the first appearance of the Lines of Paradise Lost was in oral form. And do you see a, sp a special brilliance to the pictures that he paints, which had no illustrations at the first edition, do you see a special brilliance to those pictures because they are proceeding from the eyes of a blind man? I, they're proceeding from the eyes of a blind man um, who was sighted. And so his, his visual depictions are quite vivid, they're quite colorful, they're quite precise. Uh, he's got descriptions of sunlight coming at almost horizontally at dusk that, are, that you couldn't have made up if you'd been blind from birth. A few years ago I had a student who was totally blind from birth, who studied Milton with me and I learned a lot from him, but I learned the important distinction between a blind person who has been sighted and a blind person who has never been sighted. And Milton comes in the first category. All right. All right. Last question uh, for each of you. Uh, you've got, well, I have two questions. If we've got time, we'll do two last questions. Question number one, you've got uh, dinner tonight with John Milton. What do you want to ask him? <laughs> Dennis said youngest to oldest and uh -huh. pass the mic down. Um, I'll ask him about, about books five through eight, since I already acknowledge that that's something that I've been wrestling with for a while. I usually have an idea, an answer, and then I get excited about it, and then I go to a conference and I present that as my answer, and then I do some follow-up work and I think, oh, I'm not so sure. So I want to know a little bit more about the angel Raphael, and um, I was asked this question previously, and I said, I'm not ready. I'll ask Mary Milton. I'll talk to Mary Milton first. Uh, she knew him well enough that she should give me some dirt on Milton so that I could use that against him to make myself feel comfortable when I really have that meeting. So, All right. yeah. Fair. <laughs> Philip? I would ask, so what part of De Doctrina Christiana are you responsible for writing? That's the, 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 the text that where the authorship is in question. That's a... That's a question I think that only he can answer. Fair. I, I'd say to him, John Milton, you're famous for, among other things, a work called Areopagitica, which is one of the classic works in defense of the freedom of the press. What do you actually think about the internet <laughs> now that you've seen it, now that you've seen where freedom of the press goes? Would you change your mind about that? What do you think he'd say? Well, I'd ask him because I don't really know. Um, I, and I don't know what I think because I'm, I'm deeply disturbed uh, at the flow of sewage that is part of freedom of the press, including you know press being the freedom of the media. Deeply, deeply disturbed. Uh, I'm liberta libertarian enough, maybe not a thoroughgoing libertarian, but libertarian enough that is there a human authority I trust to regulate all of those things? No, not that either. So that's the dilemma. Okay. All right, last question, and we'll go youngest to oldest. I Just see any time to think these through, are you? <laughs> e e Emily relish the fact that you get the microphone when we say youngest to oldest. 
there will come a day. We don't know that. <laughs> where you will be at the other end of the table. I just want to have a good wrinkle cream. <laughs> All right. Last question. And elucidate, but, but Dennis did a great job of, of starting us out very personal here. And I want to end personal. Um, how have your studies of Milton and, and Paradise Lost uh, changed your life, mm -hmm. if they have? Mm -hmm. How? Uh, it's a privilege to study Milton um, because it is a chance to study a lot of things that have been written before Milton. Um, one of the reasons why I chose Milton as a subject of my dissertation was because I thought I could somehow justify anything that I wanted to uh, study in preparation for that that was written before Milton died. Uh, because he had just such an amazing mind. Um, he was a, just the foremost thinker of his day. He knew, oh goodness, about seven languages. I, I'm probably underestimating him. Uh, he, he just aware of the theology, the uh, politics, the poetry, um, the um, just imaginative heritage that uh, he had was something that I thought was inspiring. Um, he's a defender of freedom uh, and a defender of uh, freedom in uh, not just political spheres or religious spheres or domestic spheres. He's also um, a defender of freedom in moral spheres. Um, and uh, he's so well learned that it's humbling, I think, to read what he has done. And I think probably the lasting influence um, on my life, I hope, um, is just a reminder that there are so many people that know much more than I do. And there's a whole world out there of information to explore. And it's okay to change your mind over the course of your life. It's okay to not figure it out once you receive your Bachelor of Arts. <laughs> I thought, you know, before my, my freshman year in college, I would figure everything out in four years, and no, I still haven't. Um, so I think Milton has uh, humbled me, and also he's given me the, because of what he talked about, because he engaged in important theological, Christian, spiritual ideas, he's also given me a pathway to talk about my own faith in conferences with um, even more of a secular tone as well. Um, Miltonists come from all different backgrounds and all different dispositions and preferences in terms of interpretation, uh, but it, it's nice to be able to talk about Milton's enterprise of asserting eternal providence, providence and justifying the ways of God to men. And that's a privilege that Milton, I think, has given to Miltonists. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Emily. Philip. Uh, I guess the thing I would point out first is that I don't think it's an accident that Emily is the coordinator for the newly established Great Text Program at uh, at HBU, and, and I'm the director of the Great Text Program at, at, at Baylor University, and the fact is that Milton uh, is an introduction to the Western intellectual tradition. You can go from Paradise Lost to everything, right? I mean, there's a way in which uh, he synthesizes, as she suggested, everything before, and I think, for me, the, that it, I had similar experience of, you know, when I first started reading Milton, coming to a passage and thinking, here, surely, he's, he's just making this up. But it's just because he's remembering a biblical passage that I forgot. And then if six months later, I'd realize what it was he was doing because he was connecting you know, three other passages that I had either forgotten or wasn't thinking about. So having that kind of uh, humbling experience repeatedly uh, has made me into a, a, better, uh, a better student of scripture. Uh, but uh, so I, I'm almost ready to be a, a good reader of the book of Job. Uh, because of studying Paradise Lost for a decade. Which, which so. brings about uh, an interesting footnote that, that I had not thought about until I combined this with what Dennis was referencing before. Milton uses so many scriptures, many of which are obscure, uh, many of which are buried deep in the speeches of Job's friends or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and he does it as a blind man mm -hmm. who's not reading the Bible at night, mm -hmm. does not have the Bible on tape, does not have Google, 
can't ask the Google mm -hmm. lords to find you know whatever mm -hmm. he needs. That's he, that is humbling. Yeah. Yeah, he's the the beneficiary of both a uh, exemplary memory as well as an art of memory. Uh, so he had you know, both advantages uh, there working in his favor. And, and having spent time memorizing. Yes, and, and using the art of memory that he'd yeah, been given. Yeah. All right. Uh, Thank you. Dennis, can you close us out? I'll, I'll try to wrap it up without being too loquacious. Um, Emily and Philip really said many of the things that I would simply repeat. What a privilege. It, it, it is to, to be a Miltonist, to read Milton, um, to soak oneself in this aspect of the Western tradition, the Christian tradition. But let me end with a, a bit of a story. Uh, one of the tasks I give my students when I'm starting a Milton course is to look at that first invocation, which I'm going to recite tomorrow night. There's the, another advertisement. Um, and ask them to choose three or four words and look those words up in the Oxford English Dictionary. Because sometimes a word means more than you thought it meant. And of course, I give them that exercise because I think I know more about what those words mean than they do. But here's the kicker. Um, a year and a half ago, students came in and, and one, a few of the lines from that invocation, to the Spirit of God, Thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sats, brooding on the vast abyss, and made it pregnant. So it's an image of generation. I thought, well, I was right about that, but here's the other thing. And so one student put up his hand and said, I looked up the word pregnant. I, I myself never looked up. I know what pregnant means. <laughs> I haven't been it, but I've seen it. <laughs> He said, and you know what? The first meaning provided by the Oxford English Dictionary about pregnant has nothing to do with babies. It means richly meaningful. <sighs> and one of the things that Milton has taught me is that the creation, in ways that I've only begun to scratch, is richly and deeply meaningful.